And hello, Seishim. My name is Evan Wiener, and we are going to talk about women who played sports. And some of these people you probably never heard of, but uh, they were significant pioneers in getting women to where they are today. After all, you've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. You're sports stars now. Maybe the first sports star, though, was Mary, Queen of Scots. She played golf. Gertrude Etherly got a ticker tape parade down Broadway back in 1926. Babe Dietrichson was the greatest athlete, according to the uh, Associated Press, woman athlete in the first half of the 20th century. Athea Gibson was a trailblazing tennis player back in the 1950s. Wilma Rudolph was a star Olympian in 1956 and also 1960. And Billie Jean King probably has, doesn't need any introduction, uh, 1960s into the 1970s. And of course, uh, she had that network TV spectacle against Bobby Riggs, the Battle of the Sexes back in 1973. How it goes, Sell was the commentator on that. And my friend, the late Shelley Saltman, actually put that promotion together. And I'm going to tell you a couple of inside things about that. And today, of course, Serena Williams is the biggest name in tennis. But uh, Mary Queen of Scots played golf. Uh, golf may have originated in Scotland or maybe even China, but we know that uh, in the 1890s, golf was played in Yonkers, New York, and it was a bunch of guys who came back from uh, Scotland in 1888, and they brought with them uh, golf equipment that started uh, golf in the United States uh, on North Broadway in Yonkers, New York. Uh, and they built it up rather quickly. And uh, the Gilded Age people decided that they were going to get involved with golf. The Vanderbilts of the world, uh, the uh, Stanford White, the architect, um, and all those other people in the 1890s and 1900s. And they used to go up to Westchester County to play. And the wives got a little upset at them because they would not allow the wives to play at the private clubs. Uh, golf starting in Yonkers and then moved up to Jackson Avenue uh, near Scarsdale and Yonkers border. Uh, 1897, the St. Andrews Club purchased new property at Mount Hope off Jackson Avenue and built an 18-hole course. The members uh, at the time included Andrew Carnegie and Stanford White. Jack Nicholas would redesign that course in 1983. There are homes on that course now, but it's the oldest course in the United States that is still being used. And there is Carnegie in 1899 uh, playing up near Jackson Avenue by Yonkers. But women were not welcome. They were told, no, 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 no. Stay home. Don't bother. You're not going to play here. I, yeah, you might like to play golf, but stay home. But these women had the means to build their own golf course. After all, they were married to people like Vanderbilt and Carnegie, so they had money. And they did decide to build their own course uh, near the original course, um, or it wasn't a course, it was three holes on North Broadway in Yonkers. Um, in 1895, John Reed, who set up that course on North Broadway, the three holes in 1888, uh, in February of 1888, then there was the blizzard of uh, 1888, so they didn't get back on the course until April. Anyway, he had built this thing up already, and he had a wife by the name of Elizabeth, and he told her, no, 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 you cannot play. We're not going to let you play. So she and some of the other St. Andrews women leased land on North Broadway, and established the Sag Hill Country Club. It soon moved to a site overlooking the Hudson River, and by 1896, it had 100 members or more, and uh, they were mostly women. But uh, men also were able to play there, and the women struck a blow against the Westchester County New York Blue Laws because of this golf course. It was called Sag Hill, and they opened it up seven days a week. In Westchester, you had to close on Sunday. That was the blue law. Um, and these women said, nope, 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 we're going to play. And they did. And they had men at their courses. And there was one man by the name of Benjamin Adams. And he decided to play golf on a Sunday. And that's against the law. And he's picked up because he played golf. 
uh, on June, in June of uh, 18, whatever. And um, he's going to go to court because he doesn't want to go to jail or to pay a fine. He was arrested for playing golf on the links at Sack Hill Golf Club. So he demanded a jury trial. And there was a jury trial. And the jury found him not guilty. He could play golf on Sunday. So could the women. And uh, so could the baseball players, because baseball players in Westchester County also couldn't go on the fields to play. So women struck a blow to the Blue Laws in Westchester County by opening up their golf course. Uh, that is an Olympic tennis player, circa 1900. Uh, the Olympics, you could play uh, tennis in the Olympics if you're a woman, uh, but that wasn't going to be too long because the Olympians or the International Olympic Committee really didn't want women at the Olympics. And there is Baron Pierre de Cordobin, and he is the guy who uh, founded the modern Olympics, which started in Greece in 1896. Uh, no women allowed. Well, he tried to marginalize women's sports, and after the 1912 Stockholm Games, he and many of his IOC colleagues believed that an Olympiad with female athletes would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and improper. So what do you do? You get rid of the women. And by 1914, the IOC's general session made it clear no women are to, to participate in track and field, but as before, they're allowed to participate in fencing and in swimming. But uh, this woman, Alice Millet of France, wasn't having any part of it. She petitioned the International Olympic Committee to let us row in the Olympics, let us do things in the Olympics. The IOC said, no, we're not going to do that. So she said, well, we'll beat you at your own game. And she and others organized the Women's Olympics in 1922, in 1926, in 1930, in 1934, as an alternative to the male-centric Olympics. Uh, the first games were staged in Paris in 1922, Gothenburg, Sweden, 1926, Prague, Czechoslovakia, 1930, and in London. Uh, England in 1934, and they got participants mostly from uh, North America, Western Europe, and Japan. The New York Times was quite astonished about how well this took place and how well the women performed. Uh, in a, well, I'm not sure if it was an editorial or an article, but this is from the New York Times, 1922, and they said, this Olympics was notable for the development of women athletes in all branches of competitions fitting to their sex. Remarkable progress was made by them, and almost overnight, they assumed the place of great prominence in the world of athletics. Um, but prior to the Olympics in 1922, there were these women. This is a munition factory during World War I, which started in England, in 1914, the United States didn't get involved in World War I until 1917. And uh, the women had to build the munitions because the men were off to war uh, in Europe. And uh, the company was called uh, Dick Kerr's. And Dick Kerr's was a uh, Preston, England-based locomotive and tram car manufacturer that was converted into a munitions production plant at the outbreak of World War I, and they had to hire the women to do the work that the men formally did. And they gave the women uh, a chance uh, for recreation. So the female workers went out to the uh, football fields, commonly known as the soccer fields here in the United States, and they showed that they could actually perform rather well on the pitch. They had an ability to play the game. They were so good. They were so good. They became England's most popular sports team. Dick Kerr's ladies, uh, they beat a rival factory, uh, Arundel uh, Courthart, uh, on Christmas Day, 1917. The war is still going on. And uh, they beat them 4-0. And there were 10,000 people watching at Preston North Deep End Stadium, the North End Deep End Stadium. Uh, on Boxing Day, which is December 26, December 26, 1920, 53,000 people watched Dick Kerr's ladies beat St. Helens' ladies for nothing. 
And there they are, Dick Kerr's ladies. And uh, in the middle of the picture, he's, they look like inmates, don't they? They all look like inmates wearing stripes. But anyway, in the middle of the picture, uh, the tallest woman is a woman by the name of Lily Parr. And she was the great player. She was six foot tall. Uh, she was athletic. Uh, she smoked on the field. She cursed like a sailor. But she was a great player, and she led this team. Uh, after the war, Dick Kerr's ladies played matches to raise money for the National Association of Discharged and Disabled Soldiers and Sailors, and they won most of their games. This was a really, really good team, and there is Lily Parr, who may have been the best women's soccer player of all time. Uh, in 1921, Dick Kerr's ladies was at the height of its popularity. Lily Parr was the star, and the team regularly attracted tens of thousands of fans to more than 60 games a year. And the men at the Football Association, which really ran soccer globally at that time, were getting very, very upset because the women had taken over uh, as the number one team uh, in a male sport. Uh, Parr started her Dick Kerr's career at the age of 14, scored 43 goals in her first season. The team ended up playing 828 matches. They won 758 of them. Drew 46, lost only 24. In that time, they scored more than 3,500 goals, and Parr scored about 1,000 of them. Uh, but England would end women's soccer on that level, and uh, did so because of popularity. On December 5, 1921, the Football Association, which was the governing body of football or soccer, had enough of the women playing the game. The FA told the women, uh, go play soccer on the recreational level. And, oh, by the way, we're not going to supply any referees anymore to officiate women's matches, and we'll probably not give you any stadiums as well. And thus ended Dick Kerr's ladies in football for women uh, in Europe back December 5th, 1921. What's the lady like? It's not ladylike at all. You can't, uh, they can't be ladies and play the sport, right? The FAA, uh, the FAA concluded that women should not be playing because football or soccer uh, was quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. And then they went out and they found some doctors. And they, these doctors said that uh, soccer posed a serious physical threat, uh, physical risk to women. The men running the FA barred women from playing at the highest level, and that would remain the policy for about five decades. In 1969, there was the women's liberation movement that was going global. There were protests, and the Virginia Slims Company, or Philip Morris Company, put out a cigarette called the Virginia Slims with the uh, slogan, you've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. The Women's Football Association was formed. And they were back on the pitch in 1969. The FA would eventually bow the pressure and ended restrictions on women playing at its stadiums in 1971. And that marks the start of the modern age of women's soccer. How many of you know who the fairway flapper was? The fairway flapper. Well, if you get Great Gatsby, the book, The Great Gatsby, you might have a clue, you might have a clue, but this happened almost a century ago. The fairway flapper was Edith Cummings. She is the first athlete, women's athlete ever on the cover of Time Magazine. She won an amateur tournament out uh, in the Chicago area. She was a great amateur golfer. In the early 1920s, American golf champion Edith Cummings became the first female athlete on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, Gertrude Etherly proved that women could be the man in one of the world's most physically demanding swims in the world, the English Channel. The times, they are a-changing. And there is Edith Cummings, great golfer, who somehow, somehow became friends with F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, she grew up around golf courses in Lake Forest, Illinois. One of her first tournament victories was at the age of 17. Uh, her brother, Dexter, was a great golfer, too, captured the intercollegiate title twice in the 1920s. But uh, it was the 1924 victory at the Women's Western Amateur that made her famous. 
Uh, Edith Cummings began or became the first woman ever on Time Magazine on the cover of the August 24th, 1924 issue. She's the first one. But she's also in The Great Gatsby a few years later. F. Scott Fitzgerald, a book that I'm sure you have in the library. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, some, like I said, somewhere along the line, whether it was boarding school or somewhere else, did meet Cummings. And he modeled his character, Jordan Baker, in The Great Gatsby, a female golfer, directly after Cummings. And uh, Cummings' friend, uh, Nerva King, was the inspiration for Daisy Buchanan. It's Gertrude Etherly. She was the first woman superstar. Well, maybe Lily Parr was, but at least in the United States, she was the first woman superstar. And uh, check out that bathing suit that she's wearing because it is important or was important to her legacy. Uh, Gertrude Etherly was born in October, 1905. She learned to swim at a local New York City public pool and the New Jersey beach. And she dropped out of school when she was a teenager to swim competitively. She joined the Women's Swimming Association and won her first local competition award at the age of 16. Two years later, in 1924, she made it to the Olympics. She wanted to swim after the Olympics, continue swimming, and she decided, you know what? That's quite the channel between France and England, and that's what I want to do. Uh, she first tried to do it in 1925, but she didn't make it all the way across, but she had experience by 1926, and she was better prepared to follow the tides, and she knew what to expect in the English Channel, a really cold place. Um, the swimsuit. Swimsuit was a problem. See, uh, in the uh, 19th century, if you wanted to go swimming um, and you were a woman, that's what you wore. Uh, in the water, and that's not conducive to competitive swimming. So she said, well, I'm not going to wear a traditional bathing suit. I'm going to design my own suit. Uh, women's bathing suits resembled wool dresses with stockings and shoes when they were designed in the 19th century. No, no, Annette, no, no, how dare you dress like that on the beach in Boston if you did so. Uh, Prudes. Wearing a skimpier suit could be illegal, and here's a story that may have happened or may not have happened, but it's a story. In 1907, police at Boston's Revere Beach possibly arrested an Australian swimmer by the name of Annette Kellerman for wearing a one-piece suit that showed her bare legs. Well, she told the story. She was kind of an actress. In fact, she was the first woman to take off her clothes in the movie. But uh, there is no official record of an arrest that's available. So it could have happened, it may not have happened, but it sounds like a pretty good story. And there is Gertrude as she uh, makes it through the English Channel. On August 6, 1926, she becomes the first woman to swim the English Channel. Only five men had ever swum the waterway before. The challenges included quickly changing tides, six-foot waves, frigid temperatures, and lots and lots and lots of jellyfish. Etherly not only made it across, she beat all of the previous men's times by swimming 35 miles in 14 and a half hours. She beat out five men with her time. And she became the conquering hero. Here she's seen um, at the ticker tape parade down Broadway. First woman ever to get a ticker tape parade down Lower Broadway uh, in the Canyon of Champions. Uh, she returned to America. There were two million people that greeted her. The first ticker tape parade to honor a woman. President Calvin Coolidge dubbed her America's best girl, but uh, famous fleeting, really fleeting in this case, and she was forgotten after Charles Lindbergh's solo flight across the Atlantic in 1927. But for a time, she was up there with Babe Ruth. She was up there with Jack Dempsey. She was up there with Al Jolson and Rudolph Valentino and, and uh, Lucky Lindy as well uh, back in the 1920s, in uh, the roaring 20s. Um, she was the only woman who was in that, uh, on that level of um, heroes uh, or sports figures uh, back in the 1920s. The Babe, she was the best athlete of 
the early part of the 20th century, the first uh, 50 years, according to the Associated Press. Mildred Dickerson Zaharias. She acquired her nickname during a Sandlot baseball game in Texas with the neighborhood boys who thought she batted like Babe Ruth. She was a talented basketball player in high school. She was recruited during her senior year in 1930 to do office work. Well, she wasn't there to do office work. She was there to help the company's semi-professional women's basketball team, the Golden Cyclones. So she was paid really to play basketball, not to, to do whatever work at uh, the Employees Casualty Company of Dallas. Between 1930 on that team and 1932, she led the team to two finals and a national championship and was voted an All-American each season. In 1932, the AAU, the Amateur Athletic Union, and they were the ones who fed uh, t uh, uh, athletes onto the Olympic team in 1932 in the championships. She placed in seven events, taking first place in five, the shot put, javelin, baseball throws, 85 meter hurdles, long jump. She tied for first in the high jump and finished fourth in the discus throw. And there is uh, the babe. Uh, her performances in the javelin throw, hurdles, and high jump qualified her to enter the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles, where she again broke world records in all three events. She won gold medals for the javelin and hurdles, and despite clearing the same height as the top finisher in the high jump, she was awarded only a silver medal because she went over the bar head first, which was illegal back in those days. And she was a great golfer. She just picked up the golf clubs, and she was great. Fort Worth Women's Invitational, November 1932. That's where she starts. At her second, second event, the Texas Women's Amateur Championship, the following April, she gets the title. But, you know, she was off the straight. She wasn't one of these country club girls like Edith Cummings or a debutante like Edith Cummings or somebody who would be in a book by F. Scott. Fitzgerald like Edith Cummings, so there were complaints from the more socially polished, polished, socially polished members of the Texas Women's Golf Association, and uh, they complained, and then the United States Association, the Golf Association, ruled her ineligible to compete as an amateur. She did become an amateur, and back in those days, it was more important for whatever reason to be an amateur than a pro. Amateur had bigger standings than pros for whatever reason back in those days. Uh, she regained her amateur status in 1943 and went on to win 17 tournaments, including the British Open, or rather the British Women Amateur Championship, first American to win that before turning professional in 1947. The following year, she helped uh, create the Ladies Professional Golf Association in order to provide some women, there weren't very, very many of them, um, a handful of professional women golfers uh, with a tournament circuit. Uh, she herself was the LPGA's leading money winner between 1949 and 1951. But there was a dark side to the babe. Uh, and it uh, was in the 1932 Olympics. Now, people talk about the 1936 Olympics when uh, Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller uh, were not allowed to uh, race uh, in the 4 by 100 meters uh, during the Hitler Olympics. But, um, and they were basically, Marty, I work with Marty Glickman, and Marty told me that uh, he felt Avery Brundage, who was the head of the United States Olympic Committee at the time didn't want two Jews uh, to win the race, and he wanted to spare the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, uh, the embarrassment of seeing two Jews on the podium. Well, there's a similar story here in 1932, and it involves Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes. Um, they were on the U.S. Olympic team in 1936, but they should have competed in 1932. They were the first African-American women uh, on that team or any team. Uh, when Pickett ran the 800 meters hurdles in Berlin in 1936, she became the first African-American woman to compete in the Olympics, but she should have done it in 1932. There was an Olympic snub. At the 1932 United States Olympic trials, Pickett competed in the 100 meter dash, winning her heat and placing third in her semifinal. She qualified for the final, 
She placed sixth. Pickett was named to the American Olympic team as part of the eight women four by 100 meter relay pool. And there she is. Louise Stokes was also part of the relay pool. The two of them were the first American, African-American women to be selected for the Olympic Games, but uh, both of them were left out of the final four women relay lineup that ran in the Los Angeles Olympics. And there is Stokes. Um, they ran into a problem called Jim Crow. Uh, Stokes and Pickett served as the first two African-American women to qualify for an Olympic team in 1932, but the coach, George Vreeland, uh, selected only white women for the final relay team. And there is the babe. And there was something to do with ice water being poured over both women's head, uh, Pickett and Stokes. Uh, the two women were sleeping in a train's bunker compartment as they were heading out to Los Angeles. Uh, Stokes on the top bunk, Pickett on the bottom. And the babe tossed a pitcher of ice water on the sleeping teammates because she was opposed to having Negro athletes on the team. Uh, when the Olympic team stopped in Denver on the train on the way to Los Angeles, Stokes and Pickett were given a room separate from the rest of the team, the eight women, uh, near a service area on the upper floor and were served dinner in their rooms rather than at the banquet for the team. They did not participate in Los Angeles. They sat and watched while the American women set a world record in the 400 meter relay and won the gold medal. Uh, Stokes is in a book, and I'm sure, or well, you may or may not have this book in the library. Uh, this is a novel called Fast Girls, a novel of the 1936 Women's Olympic Team by Elise Hooper. And um, Stokes uh, has her story uh, serialized, I suppose, in the book Fast Girls. In the 1936 Adolf Hitler Berlin Olympics, which legitimized the uh, Hitler regime as there was no boycott of that Olympics, uh, Gretel Bergman was supposed to qualify. Uh, she was the best athlete in Europe, male or female, and she would have won gold medals for Germany. Now, back around 1993, as a reporter, I went to interview Gretel Bergman over at, and her American name at this point is Martha Lambert, Martha, her original name, and Lambert, um, the name of her husband, who she married around 1938. Um, anyway, we're at the, uh, on the west side, um, and we're um, uh, at the New York Athletic Club. And it's me and Marv Schneider, who, the late Marv Schneider from the Associated Press, and Gretel Bergman, who, by the way, passed away about three years ago at the age of about 103. She had been living in uh, Forest Hills. But anyway, um, we're there. And I'm going to ask her about why she can, or at least competed for the German national team. Uh, up to the end, which she did, and uh, she knew that she wasn't going to make the team. So Marv is there, I'm there, and uh, questions start. And I, Marv used to allow me to ask the first question, and uh, which is kind of an honor, I suppose. A lot of people allowed me to do that back in those days. Um, anyway, uh, so I am talking to Gretel Bergman, and I know the whole background. She competed for the German national team. They let her compete in every event that led up to the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And uh, I looked at Gretel and I said to her, I have my question. It's a one word question, why? And she answered, I did it because I needed to give my people hope. We had so little hope. Our rights were taken away from us day by day by day by day. But I thought, I give up my people, the Jews, some hope, some hope, little hope that things will get better. They're letting me run. I knew I was never going to be on the team, but they're letting me run. They're letting me run. And, you know, we'll, we'll you know, it's going to be, we got to give, we need hope. We need hope for our people. Now, uh, in the 1936 Winter Olympics, which were held outside of, which was held outside of uh, Munich, Germany, uh, there was a hockey player by the name of uh, Rudy Bell, and uh, the Nazis cut a deal with him. He was Jewish, and they said, play for us, 
and we'll let you go after the Olympics because you're the best player on the team, and they did. No such deal was made for Gretel Bergman. Two weeks before the Olympics started, the German officials informed the Jewish athlete Gretel Bergman that she was being denied a place on the team, although she had equaled the German's women's record in the high jump. The Germans sacrificed a chance for a gold medal with this action. I was the great Jewish hope. In 1937, Gretel Bergman was able to obtain papers which allowed her and her boyfriend at the time, Dr. Bruno Lambert, who she met on the way up uh, in some competition, that allowed her to immigrate to the United States. She landed in New York with no more than $10. $10 was the limit that you could take out of Germany. You couldn't take anything else if you were Jewish and you were escaping. Um, and she eventually would work as a masseuse, a housemaid, and later as a physical therapist after she settled down in Forest Hills. It was a new life for her. There she is on the left, and there is uh, Dr. Bruno Lambert on the right. It was a brand new life for her. She continued to participate in sports while she was in the United States and won the 1937 and 1938 U.S. Women's High Jump Championships. And then that was in addition to winning the uh, 1937 Shot Put Championships. Uh, she did marry Bruno Lambert in 1938, became a citizen in 1942, and was all but forgotten. Except she was resurrected in a way in 1980 because the Wingate Institute in Israel introduced her or inducted her into the Jewish Hall of Fame and Gertrude Ab oh, Gertrude Ab um, Gertrude, <laughs> uh, Margaret Lambert, uh, was able to, uh, resonate again. Gertrude Bergman, uh, was able to resonate, uh, at least in Jewish communities. And then all of a sudden in the Olympic community. And when I saw her in 1983, she was being honored by the International Olympic Committee, United States Olympic Committee at the New York Athletic Club. And in 1996, at the Atlanta Olympics, she got a medal. Uh, she got a medal, a gold medal, because uh, the IOC, which is not usually an organization that uh, has any sympathy for too many people, decided to give her a medal because they knew 60 years earlier she would have won a gold medal at the 1936 Olympics. So she did get that medal. And uh, HBO uh, was able to persuade her to go back to Germany. I asked her whether she had been back to Germany. She said no. But Fuchs and Levinson over at, uh, Levinson over at HBO uh, put some pressure on her. We want to do your story on HBO. And the way we do your story, you got to go back to Germany. Well, you do it, and eventually they did get her to go back to Germany in 1999, and they brought her to a stadium in uh, Lappen, uh, where she used to train, and uh, it was a stadium that was renamed in her honor. There was the uh, 2004 HBO special. I don't know if you have it in the library or not. It's called Hitler's Pawn. It's really good. I have a copy of it, uh, and it's worth looking at um, from 2004, Hitler's Pawn. It took them five years to finish that documentary. And uh, she died at the age of 103 as an American in Forest Hills, out in Queens in 2017. There was another German Jew who uh, participated in the 1936 Hitler Olympics. Her name was Helene Meyer, and uh, she was a fencer. She was a great fencer, and uh, the German authorities allowed her to represent Germany at the games because uh, her father was Jewish, but her mother wasn't Jewish, but she was a non-Aryan in their mind. She was also a great fencer. And uh, she did give the uh, Heil Hitler salute after winning a silver medal in the women's individual fencing. Um, no other Jewish athlete competed for Germany in the summer games, although there were a number of uh, Jews who were at the summer games who did perform. Marty Glickman didn't, nor Sam Stoller. They didn't. Marty was bitter about it. Sam never talked to me about it. I knew both of them. Uh, Meyer died at a relatively younger age. She was 42, and there's, she didn't leave much correspondence. There are no film clips of her talking about the time. She never wrote a book. She fled to California. Um, very little is known about her. 
Uh, in 2000, Sports Illustrated named uh, Mayer uh, the greatest fencer of the 20th century. A league of their own, women's baseball, professional baseball, hardball baseball by the time this league ended. Um, it was an invention of Phil Wrigley, the guy who brought you juicy fruit and spearmint, uh, double mint uh, gum. Uh, the Chicago Cubs owner and the chewing gum magnet Phil Wrigley founded this league, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League in 1943. It lasted until 1954, and it wasn't because Wrigley was all that interested in women's baseball. Uh, he wanted to put something on for entertainment uh, that showcased women's baseball. Uh, or any baseball for that matter. Uh, Wrigley had a concern that Major League Baseball would suffer when the players were called for military service, so he came up with this idea, the bells of the ball game. But it actually delivered a high level of play. Uh, the league's peak was around 1948. They drew more than a million fans into the stands. Coincidentally, that is when there were only 500,000 televisions in the United States. And as television grew, interest in this league and minor league baseball plummeted because people stayed home and watched Milton Burrow or other shows instead of going out to watch minor league baseball or Wrigley's League. Oh, they were out there. They were the bells of the ball field. So uh, they had to dress accordingly. They had short skirts. Wrigley and the uh, league's later owner, Arthur Meyerhoff, were not ardent women liberation backers. Uh, the team's names include the Milwaukee Chicks. I'm not sure you could get away with that today, the Milwaukee Chicks. The Fort Wayne Daisies and the Rockford Peaches. Uh, players were required to embody the highest ideals of womanhood. On the field, the women had to wear lipstick, and they played in short skirts. Off the field, the girls endured mandatory charm school classes, and they were forbidden to wear trousers or drink alcohol. Uh, Casey Candell, who played with the Montreal Expos in the 1990s, uh, he and I talked about this uh, one day because his mother was in the league and taught him how to hit a curveball, which is how he got to the major leagues. And uh, he was the, uh, for the film League of Their Own, Field, uh, League of Their Own, League of Their Own, uh, he was the technical advisor uh, for that film. Here are the players listening to uh, an old coach giving them pointers as to how to play baseball. Uh, Wrigley got his talent from uh, amateur softball leagues uh, around uh, the Midwest. Uh, most of the teams in the women's league were uh, located in the Midwest. During the early seasons, the league used a large, almost softball-sized baseball. Uh, it was pitched underhanded. Uh, by the league's final years, the women's game resembled conventional baseball. Uh, with teams using a much smaller hardball and pitchers employing an overhand pitch. Uh, college uh, baseball, softball today, uh, the women are throwing underhand for the most part. Uh, but there is women's softball in college, but it's really no pro league. There was a pro team, the uh, Silver Bullets, about 27 years ago that uh, barnstormed the league, played minor league baseball teams. Uh, in the end, people lost interest in the league. Uh, a lot of it had to do with television invading the households. And once the league folded, uh, the players were limited to just recreational softball leagues. Eventually, college softball uh, came into vogue. And today, it's a big deal because you can watch ESPN and you can watch uh, uh, women's softball uh, on ESPN. Uh, there was a documentary called League of Their Own. Uh, League of Their Own, the documentary, uh, Kelly Kendall production, and that uh, gave birth to this, the movie. Madonna's in it, Tom Hanks is in it, uh, Gina Davis is in it, Rosie O'Donnell is in it, and this is the movie where uh, Tom Hanks plays a character based on uh, Jimmy Fox, the great uh, baseball player who's managing in this league. Uh, and uh, the great line is, there's no crying in baseball. <laughs> Tom Hanks, quite the movie. It's in Baseball's Hall of Fame. 
uh, the documentary um, is the documentary isn't in baseball's Hall of Fame. It should be in baseball's Hall of Fame, but the full full fledged motion picture is in baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Athea Gibson, Athea Gibson was a great 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 tennis player, really great tennis player, but she almost never had the opportunity to show how great she was. Uh, she was clearly worthy of an invitation to say the U.S. Open. Uh, and never got one. Uh, a four-time national champion by the name of Alice Marble uh, took her cause and decided to get her involved in major championships. And she wrote a letter that appeared in the July 1950 issue of the American Lawn Tennis Magazine. Uh, she noted that a committee member had told Gibson Oh yeah, we'll we'll let you come in, but you gotta, you know, you, you have to be judged by the number how you do at invitational tournaments. Except she wasn't being invited to invitational tournaments. Marble wrote, "Miss Gibson is a, over a very cunningly wrought ballot." Okay, let's start that again. Miss Gibson is over a very cunningly wrought barrel. She is not being judged by the yardstick of ability, but by the fact that her pigmentation is somewhat different. She's a fellow tennis player, and as such, deserving of the chance to prove herself. She did, she won titles. Wilma Rudolph, big time track and field star, 1956, 1960. But uh, it wasn't supposed to be that way. She should never have succeeded. She was one of 22 children. She was constantly surrounded by support and care, and she needed it because she had poor health. She survived polio, scarlet fever. Polio forced her to wear a brace on her left leg. Uh, her diagnosis was very bleak. My doctor told me I would never walk again. My mother told me I would. I believe my mother. At the age of six, she began to hop on one leg. By the age of eight, she could move around with a leg brace. By the age of 11, Rudolph's mother discovered her outside playing basketball without the brace. She quickly turned to sports, becoming a natural athlete. And there she is with some of her medals. Uh, I interviewed her in the mid-1980s. It was the mid-1980s where I got a chance to finally interview her about uh, what she did in the past. Uh, she competed in the 1956 Olympic Games and won a bronze medal in the 4x100 relay. Four years later in Rome, she went to the Summer Olympics, and it was one of the greatest performances of all time. She won three gold medals, broke at least three world records. Uh, she became the first American woman to win three gold medals in track and field at the same Olympic game. Okay, she goes home to Tennessee. Oh, they want to honor her, but there's a problem honoring her. Eventually, it's all straightened out. There is Wilma Rudolph at a parade honoring her for winning gold medals. She goes back to Clarksville, Tennessee, and she insists that her homecoming parade has to be open to everybody, whites and blacks, not the segregated event that was the usual custom in the town. Her victory parade was the first racially integrated event ever held in Clarksville, Tennessee. The second one was that night at a banquet. The townspeople threw her a banquet. She won all those medals. It was the first time in Clarksville history that blacks and whites had ever gathered together at the same event. She became a civil rights activist. Uh, my father-in-law was quite the groupie in the 1980s. Um, he used to go around with me, and unbeknownst to me, he brought his camera, and he had other people taking pictures of him with people like Billie Jean King, which is cool now because I get a chance to use some of his pictures in some of my talks, uh, and there are shots of them, them, the athletes, not performing. They're, you know, candid shots or casual shots at Oh, say the 21 Club, which is where that was, the 21 Club in Midtown Manhattan. Billie Jean King is a civil rights pioneer, and not on the same level as John Lewis or Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King or those people. She's probably a step or two down. But for the women's movement, 
She's up there on that level. Her role in the civil rights movement for the women in uh, the 1960s is clearly defined. She pushed for equal prize money in the men's and women's matches after winning. The U.S. Open in 1972 when she was paid $15,000 less than the men's champion, Ely Nastassi. She threatened to sit out the 1973 U.S. Open in Forest Hills if the prize money was not equal by the following year. In 1973, the U.S. Open became the first major tournament to offer equal prize money for men and women. That was the Forest Hill event before they moved to Flushing Meadow. Uh, Title IX, Billie Jean King's aggressive equal rights stance in the 1960s was part of a sea change that culminated in getting that law passed. Title IX of the 1972 Education Amendments uh, change women's sports and opportunities for women in educational opportunities. But uh, before I get into Billie Jean King, I want to go to the Boston Marathon of 1967. And there you see Kay Switzer. Catherine Switzer grew up as the daughter of a major in the U.S. Army. So failure was never an option for her. While studying at Syracuse University, one of her coaches told her that she's a frail woman. You can't run the Boston Marathon. She told the coach that. He said, you're frail, you're dainty, you're this, you're that, you're that. Although I kind of wonder about that because, you know, you look at uh, women's ages and men's ages, women generally outlive men. And if you remember the comedian, Alan King, remember Alan King used to be on the Ed Sullivan Show? He had this great routine called Survive By where he used to take out obituaries from the newspaper of men, and he would read uh, the obituary, and the guy would be a certain age, survive by, survive by. By the way, Alan King was survived by his wife. Anyway, so she trained in secret and entered the race, and uh, that is Jock Semple. He's very, very upset that K. Switzer, K. period Switzer, enters the race and is actually in the race, and it looks like He's about ready to commit assault by pushing her down uh, and knocking her out, which she could have landed on her face, and broken a jaw, broken teeth, broken nose. She could have landed on her hands, broken wrists and all that. This looks like assault, but fortunately, she's running with her boyfriend who happened to be a nationally ranked at the time, her boyfriend, a nationally ranked uh, track and field star. Uh, so he pushes old Jock out of the way. And uh, they began to worry about, oh, my God, did, did I just commit assault on old Jock? Um, the people who work for the marathon tried to physically pull her out of the race. Semple tried to remove her. Uh, and then her body, who uh, weighed, uh, her boyfriend, who weighed 235 pounds, nationally ranked hammer thrower, running with her because he said, if you could do it, I could do it. Knock Semple to the ground. She would uh, finish the race in four hours and 20 minutes. Patsy Mink, Congresswoman from Hawaii, 1965 through 1977. Um, she was told back in 1944 and onward that she's a dainty thing. You know, she shouldn't be able, she shouldn't think about participating in heavy duty sports. Uh, in 1944, she was at Maui High School, and she was a valedictorian and played college, rather high school basketball there. And that's Edith Green, Congresswoman from Oregon. They're responsible for Title IX. The ally, uh, Ted Stevens, the senator from Alaska, and Birch Bayh, the senator, the Democrat from Indiana, all of them put together Title IX. Patsy Mink was elected the first female president of the student body at Maui High School. She became the valedictorian of her graduating class in 1944. She played basketball, but only half-court basketball because full court would be too taxing for high school students, girl high school students. They're dainty. They're fragile. Uh, Title IX, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Uh, Richard Nixon, uh, yeah, him. I knew Nixon. I dealt with him starting in 1985 when he was the arbitrator between the Major League Baseball Umpires Association and the Major League Baseball owners in the dispute. 
that um, Richie Phillips, who was the head of the Umpires Association, uh, got settled by suggesting to Major League Baseball Commissioner Peter Uberoth that uh, we need arbitration. And Uberoth said, who do you have in mind? Dick Nixon. Dick Nixon, get out of here. How do you know Dick Nixon? Well, Richie was neighbors of David and Julie Eisenhower. And every weekend, uh, Dick and Pat went down from uh, Park Ridge, New Jersey uh, to Society Hill off the main line in Philadelphia and babysat. Uh, Grandpa Dick was here. Uh, anyway, uh, he signs the Title IX legislation into law, uh, which gave women an equal opportunity to get an education in American colleges and universities with men. It changed women's sports. Men no longer got 95% of the dollars earmarked for sports, which caused a great deal of friction in the men's teams, coaching fraternity. A good number of those coaches thought Title IX took away their ability to get the best athletes for their team because they couldn't spend scholarship money solely for men's teams anymore. The battle of Title IX legislation in women's sports is still being fought. Some coaches and athletic uh, athletic directors crying foul, saying that they have to cut men's sports programs and keep women's programs to stay in compliance with Title IX rules. Ann Myers uh, at UCLA was the first woman to ever get a sports scholarship. She was a basketball player who also played at uh, or played for the Indiana Pacers in the preseason in 1979. Um, she got her scholarship two years after Title IX was passed. Uh, she signed the contract with the Indiana Pacers, but failed to make the team. But she was the first woman ever to get, be given a shot uh, with the NBA. Uh, this is Bernice Guerra, a Queens housewife in the 1960s. And she's sitting around. She doesn't feel fulfilled as just a housewife. And she's talking to her husband. What am I supposed to do? I want to do something else with my life than just, you know, spraying furniture polish and cleaning off tables and washing floors. And they're talking and talking and talking. And, well, what do you like? Well, I like baseball. Well, baseball. Hey, maybe you can become a baseball umpire. And she did. She went to umpiring school. In 1969, Bernice Guerra received a contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season New York Penn League. Uh, she received a telegram from the then NA PBL president, Philip Python, informing her that her contract was disapproved and invalid. Well, she wasn't going to take it. Three years, three years later, she's on the field after three years of court battles. There she is as a baseball umpire. On June 24th, 1972, Bernice Guerra, after three years of court battles, gets onto a minor league baseball field up in the New York Penn League around the New York Finger Lakes. She umpires a Class A minor league game between the Geneva New York Rangers and the Auburn New York Phillies of the New York Penn League. Uh, well, she gets to uh, her hotel, which is kind of a Motel 6 type hotel, one step ahead of a no-tell motel, because that's the way it is in minor league baseball. And uh, there are only two umpires, uh, she and, and another one. And uh, she gets to the hotel, and there's a bunch of baseball fans picketing her that she's going to umpire the game. Signs that said, you belong at home. Uh, be, you be belong at home, not home plate. Um, and she was getting no respect from her other umpire. Uh, there's a call that she overturns on a double play, and the manager of the Auburn team, Nolan Campbell, starts screaming and yelling at her. And the other umpire, usually the other umpire comes in to get the manager or whoever is arguing away from the umpire, doesn't do it, doesn't do it at all. And she eventually throws him out of the game after he said, you should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. Now, normally another umpire would usher, or rather another umpire would usher somebody back to the dugout, giving him words, hey, you know what, this isn't cool. This umpire put his arm around Nolan Campbell and right away Gira knows she's not getting any support. It's a double header that day. She resigned after the first game, citing lack of support. 
You've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. You've got your own cigarette now, baby. You've come a long way. The Virginia Slims Tennis Circuit, the cigarette in the left hand and the tennis racket and ball in the right hand. Um, Billie Jean King and I talked about uh, the Virginia Slims sponsorship of the women's tour. And uh, she said we had to take it. Uh, the first women's organized tour, couldn't find the sponsors. Billie Jean King told me over the interviews over the years, oh, we went to Madison Avenue, we banged on doors. They never opened the doors. And even if they did open the door, they'd look, oh, it's you, and slam the door in our face. So they took Philip Morris's money. Despite the fact that the 1964 Surgeon General's report that cigarette smoking was harmful to a smoker's health, uh, the only company that wanted to give them money was Philip Morris, and they took the money, blood money, as she said. Uh, it was formed in 1970, and all because Billie Jean King challenged the United States Lawn Tennis Association first for giving players money under the table to compete in their invitationals, and then for not giving money, uh, equal money to players. And, uh, and she was a rebel, and they decided, we're going to get even with you. Uh, we're not going to we're just not going to schedule any women's tournaments during the year. And if we don't do that, that means you're not going to be in the big tournaments. Uh, so there were nine players altogether, dubbed the original nine, and they rebelled against the U.S. LTA due to, among other things, the wide inequity between the amount of prize money paid to male tennis players and female tennis players. And Billie Jean King is in the Houston tournament. They scheduled it. So did uh, Virginia Slims in 1970. And uh, they were told, if you participate in this tournament, you'll never, we're gonna blackball you. And the women said, we dare you. We absolutely dare you. And that uh, tournament in Houston was sponsored by uh, Virginia Slims and Virginia Slims started putting up money for women in 1971. The nine, Billie Jean King, Rosie Casales, Nancy Ritchie, Peaches Barkowitz, Kirsty Pidgeon, Valerie Ziegenfuss, Julie Heldman, Carrie Melville Reed, and Judy Taggart Dalton. All nine of them put their tennis careers at risk. Um, they um, held on. Uh, Virginia Slums was a major sponsor. In 1983, um, there was an anti smoking group uh, which caught up with Billie Jean King at a protest. And uh, they said to her, why'd you take the money? And she said, I believe in the free enterprise system. It's up to the women herself or the woman herself to make that choice whether to smoke or not smoke. The most important thing is that we're well informed and that we make our own decision. Uh, Erla, uh, rather, Ellen Merlo, who is the director of uh, marketing communications for Philip Marsh USA, made Virginia Slim cigarettes, noted that the company did indeed sponsor the tour from 1971 through 78. And she said, we never ask any of the players to endorse what we're doing. Uh, when we get involved in any promotion, it's obviously to create a greater visibility for a brand name. That was uh, Merlo. Uh, but we never ever ask any player to endorse our product. They didn't have to. Just take a look at the logo, the cigarette, and the tennis racket. There was signage all over the place. There was the Virginia Slims name all over equipment. Um, so they didn't have to ask the players. The players, by not saying anything, by playing, endorsed the product, Virginia Slims. But as Billie Jean King once told me, it was blood money and we couldn't get any other money. And Shelly Saltman, the late Shelly Saltman, that is in November of 2015 out in Los Angeles. Uh, when I went out to pay a visit to Shelly and some other friends. And Shelly Saltman was one of the five most important men in promoting women's sports in the 1970s. I know Shelly's listening to me now, wherever he is, because I expect a phone call saying, my ears are burning, what are you talking about? Uh, Shelly was the promoter of the 1973 Network TV extravaganza, the Battle of the Sexes featuring Billie Jean King and Bobby Briggs. It was September 20th, 1973. The Battle of the Sexes, more than 30,000 fans filled into the Houston Astrodome and celebrities like Salvador Dali was mingling with what appeared to be aliens wearing tuxedos. And <laughs> I always laugh when I see this picture because I know 
what went behind this picture. This was one of Shelley's promotions, the Cleopatra entrance. Shelley went over to Rice University and found four well-built men to carry Billie Jean King on a riser into the Houston Astrodome because it was more than a tennis match. It was a network spectacular of entertainment. So there is uh, Billie Jean King being led into the arena by those four Rice students, Rice University in Houston. And uh, <laughs> there's Bobby Riggs, Sugar Daddy, sponsored Bobby Riggs, and uh, Shelly went out there to find Riggs Pigs uh, because uh, Bobby Riggs uh, said that um, he's the Sugar Daddy of Riggs Pigs, who are buxomy woman uh, that Shelly picked out uh, to hang out with Bobby Riggs because it was the battle of the sexes, and Riggs was a chauvinist. It was all part of the show. Uh, King entered the playing court on a gold litter carried by four shirtless members of the Rice University track team. While Riggs arrived via rickshaw, flocked by his bevy of Bobby, Bobby's, sorry for laughing because I, I just hear Shelley when he was telling me this, by Bobby's bosom buddies. Then they exchanged pregame gifts a baby pig for the chauvinist Riggs, which Shelley picked out, a giant sugar daddy lollipop for Billie Jean King. And there they are, Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs battling for something. Uh, Billie Jean King at that point of her life said it was really important for her to show that women were moving ahead. But, you know, we talked about that. It was one of these well, you beat a 55-year-old guy and you're only 31, or you lost to a 55-year-old guy. And she said, you know, looking back, what was I doing? Except, she said, remember, Title IX had just passed. I really didn't want to, to be uh, weakened. I thought with Margaret Court, she had played Riggs before, losing it, it would be a good chance for some of the people to start jumping on the bandwagon to weaken Title IX, hurt our tour, hurt women's sports, hurt the women's movement. As soon as I found out Margaret had lost, I knew I definitely was going to play Bobby. I didn't have a choice. Now, you might have the Battle of the Sexes video uh, in the um, library. Uh, Shelley was not depicted in the library, uh, rather in the movie. Um, and Shelley and I talked about it, and he saw the movie, and he said a lot of that stuff was made up by Hollywood. And he had this Marilyn Barnett, who is the hairdresser, wasn't really part of what was going on uh, during 1973, but somehow she has a central role in the 1973 Battle of the Sexes. There's Howard! I know Howard, I knew Howard. I'm still friends with his uh, grandsons, Justin and Colin Cosell. Colin is the PA announcer for the New York Mets, and uh, Jared uh, Kahana, who is an ESPN attorney. Um, Bobby Riggs has this interview with uh, Howard as part of the pregame ceremonies. I'll tell you why I, I'll win. She's a woman, and they don't have the emotional stability. Um, she would win. She would become very friendly with Bobby Riggs. They would be on the odd couple together when Bobby Riggs is hustling Oscar Madison out of money and everything else. Um, and Billie Jean King would out-hustle Bobby Riggs on that show. They ended up, they being Bobby uh, Riggs and Billie Jean King, very good friends, and at the end of Bobby Riggs' life, when uh, there were bills that needed to be paid, Billie Jean King helped with those bills. On November 7th, 1973, the state of New Jersey became the first state to allow girls to play Little League Baseball. The tennis stars, Chrissy Everett. Well, Chrissy Everett came, uh, did not uh, participate with uh, Billie Jean King initially. Uh, there she is with um, my father-in-law, but uh, she was a big tennis star. Martina, who came out of uh, Czechoslovakia and the system out of Czechoslovakia. Martina Navratilova, and today Serena Williams, uh, the big tennis star, and Venus Williams, the big tennis star. Nadia Komenich was the big uh, Olympic star in 1976, coming out of the Romanian system. Uh, Nadia Komenich was the first gymnast to be awarded a perfect score of 10 in an Olympics event. She was credited with intensifying interest in gymnastics. Uh, after the 1976 games in Montreal, she was named a hero of the Socialist Labor Party in uh, Romania. 
The song used to accompany her floor exercises was retitled Nettiest Thing. The Young and the Restless, it became an international hit, earning a Grammy Award in 1977. Nancy Lopez in 1978 was the golfer of the year as a rookie. Uh, she won nine tournaments, five consecutively. She appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated when Sports Illustrated mattered back then in July. Won the Barry Trophy for the lowest scoring average on the tour, was the LPGA Rookie of the Year, the LPGA Player of the Year, and was named the Associated Press Female Athlete of the Year. Post-1972, without Title IX, at least in the United States, there would be no Jenny Finch, no U.S. World Cup soccer championship team, no WNBA, no Misty May Trainer, no Kerry Walsh, no Lindsey Vaughn. Almost every female athlete in the United States, make it all female athletes in the United States, has benefited from Title IX in one way or another. The 1996 U.S. Olympic team, that was in Atlanta, um, th that was supposed to be used, the Atlanta Olympics, as the launching pad for a professional women's basketball league. There were two that started right afterward. Uh, women's college basketball was gaining in popularity. The NBA noticed. 1996, Summer Olympic team in Atlanta was going to be a launching pad for the Women's National Basketball Association. That team steamrolled through the opposition and won the gold medal in Atlanta. If there was ever a league set up for success, it should have been the WNBA. They had the best player, Cheryl Swoops, but uh, it didn't work. People weren't interested, didn't go to games. The WNBA became a financial drain for the NBA. Two women's leagues started, the NBA and uh, sponsored the WNBA and the American Basketball League. Uh, the NBA was very serious about including women in the business. The league hired Violet Palmer as a referee in 1947. The American Basketball League actually offered higher salaries, and that was its undoing. The league folded after its third season or during its third season of operations right before Christmas, 1998, December 22nd. The ABL was broke. Uh, Brandy Chastain pulled off her jersey after the 1999 United States women's national soccer team won the World Cup. And again, if a league was set up for success, it should have been the subsequent uh, women's Soccer League called the WUSA. It failed. National women's team or the national women's team did attract interest uh, and it was popular. Uh, it's always popular during the Olymp World Cup. Uh, but in 2001, the United uh, Women's United Soccer Association started. It had solid backing from the cable TV industry, but it had a problem. People didn't go to see them. The stands were empty and the league folded in 2003. There have been subsequent women's leagues since then. And that still struggles, women's soccer still struggles in attracting an audience. Some of the big athletes of today, Katie Ledecky in swimming, Lindsey Vaughn uh, in skiing, uh, Danica Patrick in auto racing, or Rhonda Rosie in MA, uh, MMA, uh, Reagan Rapinoe, who was at the White House in March, uh, meeting with Joe Biden, telling Joe Biden uh, women should be paid for equal work. The United States national uh, soccer team does not get equal pay with the men. And uh, it's been a sticking point for the USA women uh, national team. They also have worse conditions. Uh, in uh, 2018, the Nielsen Report uh, survey of uh, sports fans in the United States across eight markets, 84% of general sports fans say they have an interest in women's sports. Uh, they have an interest in both men in women's sports or just in women's sports. 51% of those people who were surveyed were male. And uh, for the advertising and sponsorship community, this confirms that women are interested in watching women's sports and that women's sports represents a major opportunity to engage male fans. Brandy Chastain, Chastain told me in 2008, we need a good old girls network. How do you get a good old girls network? You get education in college and women rise to the level of CEOs. There are women who own teams today uh, in various sports. 
um, including uh, the Seattle team in the uh, Women's National Basketball Association. Um, and uh, Mrs. Ford runs the uh, Detroit Lions football team, although she got it through the family. Um, so if you have a good old girls network, you might be able to propel sports into the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s on some equal footing with the men. But there's work to do. I want to thank Ellie for inviting me uh, to the library. And I hope you uh, enjoyed this little presentation of uh, women in sports and uh, how women, uh, at least the women in Yonkers, changed sports uh, and allowed men to play baseball in Westchester back in the late 1890s, or how women actually had their own Olympics uh, back in 1922 and 24 and 30 and 1934. And there was a women's professional baseball league way back when in the 1940s and uh, how women uh, had to struggle to get ahead and are still struggling to get ahead. Again, thank you, Ali. Thank you for watching. My name is Evan Weiner. Hope you enjoyed our little talk and uh, we'll see you again in the future. Take care, everybody, and bye-bye.